So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for today's virtual conversation, Getting Real About Racial Wealth Inequities, Reflections and Next Steps. I'm Dorian Warren. I'm the president of the Center for Community Change Action and co-chair of the Economic Security Project. And I'm excited to be hosting today's discussion, which is presented in partnership with the Insight Center for Community Economic Development and Prosperity Now. For this first chat in Insight's new virtual conversation series, I'm honored to be joined by Ann Price, president of the Insight Center, and Diedrich Asante Mohammed, senior fellow for the Racial Wealth Divide Initiative at Prosperity Now. Thank you both for joining us today and welcome to the very first one. This is the first one, so we're gonna have a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it. Yes, very much. So before, before we get into today's discussion, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping details for our audience out there. So for everyone but the panelists, your microphones will be muted for the length of the discussion, but we invite you to use the question function on your control panel to submit any questions or comments that you might have. And I'll relay those questions to our panelists and to everyone on the call. We'll try to cover as many of your questions as we can in our limited time today. So don't hesitate to send them in early and we'll try to work them into the conversation as best as possible. You can also follow and add to this conversation, of course, on Twitter. You wanna use these two hashtags, hashtag getting real about race and hashtag racial wealth gap. And be sure to tag our host at at Insight CCED, as well as at Prosperity Now. So turning back to our panelists, we're here today to get real about the racial wealth gap and racial wealth inequities. And I wanna start by just getting to the heart of the issue and have some real talk about actual solutions and where both you, Anne and Diedrich, see the field at large and where you see it maybe making some mistakes or some wrong strategic turns. So you both have been working on this issue for a number of years and you've issued multiple reports, you've given hundreds of talks, you've talked with dozens of organizers, policymakers, you've been in the long struggle to advance racial equity. So let's start with each of you telling us a little bit about what you've learned in all these years of working to end racial wealth inequities and how has the conversation shifted over the years? So let's start with you, Anne. Well, when I really reflect on this movement over the past several years, I think there was really an incredible vision to thinking about reducing racial wealth inequities. And we have to credit a large part of that with Kololo Kijikazi and her vision about how she thought we could address this issue. There's been some really important and seminal work that's really defined this, this movement. And I think in the early days, and I call them kind of the pioneers, and we just know because he's been in this work longer than I have, there have been some seminal pieces that I think have really defined this work. Um, of course, we know about black wealth, white wealth, but I think really something that's been underrated is the work that was done by five women of color called the Color of Wealth that really is a primer in understanding how policy has shaped wealth outcomes for several different racial and ethnic groups. The Cost of Being African American by Tom Shapiro, Lifting, Lift As We Climb by Mariko Chang. I think Thomas Mitchell's work on looking at air property rights and what he was able to do um, and what that means for land ownership is pivotal. Um, and also the, the research that Andy Darity and Derek Hamilton have been doing uh, focused on slaves I think the report, Umbrellas Under the Rain, is, is really uh, a critical part of this work. So what's really, have I looked at this, this work kind of in two stages. One, this early pioneering stage when groups of people came together and said, we're gonna take on this very bold, audacious goal. And their focus was very, very, it was structural. It was about building community wealth. It was about dealing with issues of redistribution, of restitution, of reparations. This work was really headed towards um, kind of bold, transformative policy. Um, but I do think there has been a shift in where we're going. I'd love to get into that a little bit as we go on with the discussion. So Diedrich, what, what have you learned all these years being in the thick of this? And how, is the, how have you seen the conversation shifting? You've always understood there's deep racial economic inequality. 
I think, you know, this whole idea of looking at wealth in particular as a primary economic indicator, uh, you know, has been something that really over the last, I think, five or six years has gotten more popular attention. Uh, Anne's already named you know, many of the uh, books, I think, Black Wealth, White Wealth, kind of helped get it out in the mainstream. So I remember looking at a book when I was 12 or 13 years old. I think it was called The Black Power Imperative, written mm -hmm. by a white guy, but it was like 600 pages long. And I was reading it because, but I couldn't keep through it because that just was so long, but because it was already saying that this was written in maybe the 70s, that it would take a thousand years to bridge wealth inequality uh, if things kept going the way they were. And I was like, this is too depressing. I can't take that. Um, but then as I got older, I started studying, you know, uh, refocusing on looking at race and economics and then started being connected to this group that uh, Anne's talking about. You know, Keith Jakazi really started pulling together many experts focus on different aspects of economics and racial inequality and help bring us together to develop a shared synergy around the language around racial wealth gap racial wealth divide with uh you know bringing us together all of us writing but all of us being in constant conversation i think helped uh break out this conversation from among you know some experts or what have you to a more popular conversation i always say it used to be if i saw something about racial wealth inequality I knew the author. I personally knew them because there's very few people writing about it. But I think mm -hmm. by the uh, kind of Black Lives Matter uh, you know, of rebellions, uprisings, demonstrations, uh, mainstream media started pulling out and more and more uh, nonprofits started using this frame. You know, and I think maybe we'll get into this. You know, I think the racial wealth divide, racial wealth gap frame is a quite radical frame that actually uh, helped overcome some of the things that we were uh some of the narratives that we were living through under the Obama administration, like that, the idea that we were post-racial, that, that we were on the way to achieving racial equity. When you look at racial wealth inequality, there's no way uh, you can make those claims. So I think we've come a long way in this frame being something that pe more people are talking about, but people still don't understand, I think, the radical nature of what it means to really uh, try to deal with this issue of racial wealth divide and racial wealth gap. So I want to I want to stick with this because I, I I have so many questions for you and one is about challenges. I want to come back to that. Actually, why don't you explain to us what is the racial wealth gap in a sense? Because there's so much data out there that we see all the time. So can you both walk us through what the data is telling us right now? Well, I I have to say that. I do think that, and I'll get into this, why even referring to this as a racial wealth divider gap is, is, mm. is kind of derail us from what our real goal is. But you know, this really started by being able to demonstrate the wealth holdings of um, people of color, primarily uh, Black and Latinos versus uh, and Asians and whites. And you know, at a time, we were just looking at kind of these two sets of numbers, how much uh, wealth was held. And, you know, over the years, each time we look at this, this measure, we see that the difference is, is getting wider and wider. Um, and so really, really what we're talking about, we talk about wealth, uh, the definition of what you, what you own minus what you owe, but it's so much more. It is really about a uh, true opportunity, about uh, freedom to make choices for your family, um, it's about, you know, being able to, uh, you know, be in a community that, that has resources. It's so much more than just that term. And I think some, along, somewhere along the way, we kind of got caught up with saying, we're here to close a gap. Uh, a gap is, you know, $10,000, $20,000, not, not $100,000 and $200,000. We're talking about something significantly different here. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, again, you know, racial wealth, and again, I've always used this phrase, racial wealth divide, because I thought it better highlights the effect it has on society than a gap. A gap's kind of like, oh, how did that happen? Like, oh, there's just some hole here, and we need to fill the gap. But I like the divide because I think it, it helps you see better how it uh, you know, creates, creates and adds on to divisions in society, and it really has to be something we intentionally uh, deal with in order to, uh, and we have to bring people together. So that's why I can use the term racial wealth divide, but there's no, uh, you know, technical difference between racial wealth divide, racial wealth gap. But, you know, just to, you know, share with the audience, the numbers we use, we oftentimes use median wealth and we don't include, uh, like, 
like your car and these types of assets. And so I think the most recent data from 2016, that we've broken it down, the median wealth for whites is $140,500. The median wealth for blacks is $3,400. The median wealth for Latinos is right around $6,000. So you can see this massive disparity. You know, blacks and Latinos generally make about 60 cents on every dollar as whites in terms of income. But in terms of wealth, we're looking at around uh, three, four cents of on every dollar that whites have in wealth. And uh, I think that shows the uh, you know great economic disparities and why in 2018 we still have much of the racial inequality that still exists today. So, Dietrich, you just said 2018. And, um, of course, later this month will be the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report, which was written in response to the urban uprisings in 1967 that, of course, we know continued um, through 1968 and especially after Dr. King was assassinated in April of 68. So one of the things from that Kerner Commission report, I mean, there's the famous line about how there's two countries, one black, one white, separate and unequal, moving apart. It talked a lot about racialized poverty in that report. So to both of you, and, and Diedrich, let's start with you on this question. 50 years after the Kerner Commission report that outlined a lot of these issues, especially around racial wealth and poverty, the flip side, what has changed in 50 years when it comes to, as you call it, the racial wealth divide? Yeah, I, you know, not as much as I think many had hoped. Um, you know, I think if you go back maybe more in the 50s, you see some great changes from African Americans and even, you know, all Americans as a whole, poverty has gone down compared to the poverty rates in the 1950s. You know, you had the war on poverty in the, uh, the, the mid-60s, early 60s, and that did do things, particularly to lower poverty among the elderly and among youth and children, right? But nonetheless, we still have uh, poverty rates in the African-American community, I think around 25%, so that's still uh, radically uh, quite high. Um, but things like unemployment, you know, we've had unemployment disparities of African Americans having twice the unemployment rate of whites since the 1963 March on Washington for freedom and jobs, right? So the King's I Have a Dream speech, that really hasn't budged in over 50 years. Uh, we don't have the greatest wealth data for 50 years, but we do have pretty strong wealth data from 1983 to today, and we see that the wealth divide is, uh, is not coming together. Uh, generally, it's, it's generally uh, growing. And I think, you know, this gets into a little bit in the 50s and 60s, you might have had more outright racism segregation, but you had a progressive economy in the sense that those who were poorest or middle class saw the greatest uh, growth in terms of, uh, of, of, of economic benefits from a growing economy. Uh, since about the 1980s, we have an economy where even when the economy is growing and doing well, most most and sometimes almost all of that is going only to the wealthiest. So we kind of, um, you know, as we won civil rights and as we won, uh, you know, uh, uh, fights to lessen some discrimination, we uh, entered into an economy that was more and more regressive and has actually helped maintain many of these barriers. And so I think in a lot of ways, you know, I always say, you know, the civil rights movement in many ways, you could argue, ended in 1968. And I think, you know, part of, you know, with the death of King, assassination of Robert Kennedy, the kind of shutdown of the Poor People's Campaign, uh, you know, we got some victories in that battle, but, but overall, I think we lost the war. And I think, you know, for the last 50 years, we've kind of been in the wilderness. And, you know, when are we going to take up that battle again and deal with what I consider the heart on the foundation of racial inequality, which is racial economic inequality, which is much more hard to deal with because then you got to deal with not taking down signs, racist signs but actually redistributing wealth and resources. And that's something this country has not been willing to do. So, and same question. What have we learned 50 years after the Kerner Commission, after the assassination of Dr. King and others that year, the end of the poor people's movement, as Deidre just said, what have we learned about the ra racial wealth inequities? Well, uh, you know, when you really look back and even listen to the other American speech that MLK did, um, and, and he's really laying out, you know, you know what ha what's really still uh, troubling after the civil rights uh, movement, civil rights days, right? Uh, talking about, oh yes, you can sit at a lunch counter, but the ability to live in decent housing and have a job that pays a decent wage is still 
uh, alluding uh, many people of color, black specifically. Um, you know, I think the thing is that we it, it may have you know seen some bit of progress. We don't have data, as we just said, going back that far. But you know, look what happened at the, at, during the Great Recession. Uh, this was the greatest stripping of wealth in modern America, right? So. Um, whatever gains were made that we couldn't necessarily measure, we know that a great deal, a great loss has occurred. And, and we're really talking about how do we even regain what was lost and what was really not lost, what was really extracted and what was really stolen. So um, when we really think about the last 50 years, uh, most of the color are really still not in a position to, uh, you know, see a better future in terms of their economic mobility and, and stability in the next generation. So um, I just want to intervene and remind our audience that you can follow this conversation on Twitter with the hashtags getting real about race and hashtag racial wealth gap. And of course, be sure to tag our host at Insight CCEV and at Prosperity Now in that conversation. So Diedrich and Ann, you both have used different language in describing racial wealth inequities, the racial wealth divide, racial wealth gap. And obviously you know that the framing wars are important in how we talk about any issue. Um, I at the Roosevelt Institute with my colleagues, we talk about the racial rules that structure um, economic outcomes, particularly for black folks and especially for black women. But talk to us about how your organizations have decided how to frame this issue and why you made those particular decisions to talk about this and in, in whether divide, gap, inequity. Tell us why, how you talk about this and why. And let's start with you. Sure. Well, you know, I think that the way that Roosevelt has really talked about those hidden rules is a really great frame. And, uh, you know, it really wasn't until very recently, and this is something that we looked at, we were looking at how is this issue actually being put out in the media and how is it really being talked about. And really about five or six years ago, discussions about the racial wealth gap were really about the data, they were about data points, and really lacked the kind of understanding or narrative that lets us know how do we even get here. Um, you know, to talk about race and wealth and equity is an ugly truth. It is about uh, people both uh, being chattel and, and, and an asset um, and being their bodies being extracted from wealth. And also a number of rules and policies that uh, act to extract wealth out of communities of color. And so um, the reason that we chose to move away from just talking about the race gap is because one, it didn't allow us to really enter into that uh, you know, kind of deep historical discussion that really defines uh, how, why some people have wealth and others don't, and to say how people are advantaged over others. Um, because some people have wealth because others don't, and that wealth is extracted. Um, and also because that language really, really, uh, in terms of how it resonates and how people see themselves in the world, uh, a gap is not something you usually see as something they can solve. Um, and, and also around kind of mobilization and organizing, people are not getting out in the streets to say close this gap. Uh, they really want to deal with those deep seated policies, the rules, the hidden rules of youth talk about that have cemented people in place that are actually hurting and harming families and communities. And David, yeah, no, why, you know, why? Why? No, so why divide? Yeah. Why racial wealth divide? Sure. You know, and again, you know, this uh, goes back to when I was at United for a Fair Economy and, uh, you know, that organization was part of some of the early groups uh, working with Kilo Kijikazi and other groups. And we were uh, led by Mei Zhu at that point, uh, United for a Fair Economy. And, you know, the, the phrase that was growing was racial wealth gap. And again, I kind of said, I don't know how I fell into racial wealth divide like where, where I saw that. But I was like, no, I, I do want to stick with this because I think this three word phrase again, does uh, give more insight to the effects it has. I think it also is a good entryway into conversations. I think too often times when we talk about race, we want to talk about race relations and how mm. people feel about each other and changing, you know, our, you know, the, kind of the hearts of people, what have you. 
But I think, you know, racial wealth divide is a way where you can say, well, one, we're talking about, you know, it, not, not just feelings, but concrete numbers, and that there is real disparity when throughout America's history, we, you know, in the 60s, uh, the, so the major polls for white people said that uh, African Americans were pretty near uh, equality with blacks, right? And so th there's always this belief that you know, African Americans or disenfranchised people of color doing much better than they are. So I feel like the racial wealth divide gives, uh, you know, an entryway into understanding, wow, you know, you can't debate these numbers. These are all government numbers. And uh, there is some type of disparity. And then it gets into the question of, well, how to address it? How does it come up? So I like that it gets into the uh, structural aspect. And one thing I'll say, too, is, you know, I said that racial economic inequality is the foundation of racial uh, of racial inequality. And I believe the racial wealth divide is the foundation of racial economic inequality, right? Because economics can also do with your income, employment, all these other issues. But I think kind of the heart and soul of this is looking at wealth uh, as an indicator. Uh, you know, we've, there's been different studies that show, you know, blacks and whites of the same income, their children, uh, white children still do a little bit better than black children. But actually, whites and blacks of the same wealth, you see black children doing as well as better because uh, wealth allows you to take advantage of opportunities. It allows you to deal with the ups and downs of the economy. Uh, it, it allows stabilization in a household. So I, th you know, th I think that phrase, racial wealth divide, helps as an entryway into more structural conversations about what needs to change uh, in our economy. And two, we can get into this more later, in our organizations, in our nonprofits, mm -hmm. even in service work. I, I think it, 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 it's not just a large policy discussion conversation i think it can filter all the way down to our day-to-day -day work so i would so agree with that i would agree with that. i just want to piggyback on something because i think it is important to, to emphasize uh what you just said did you in the sense that you know the importance of looking at wealth over income um and and that this is really the definition of true success for us as communities of color that wealth is that indicator and it allows us to to look into the lens of so many types of policies from from redlining um, to, to uh, areas of, of health, obviously employment, employment discrimination. It is a window into really understanding um, where we live and how we live. So uh, it, it's critical that we, we think of it in this way and, and think about those uh, inequities as being so deep-seated. And, and if Dorian, if you don't mind me, I'll jump in one more time. Because also, I think it's important, you know, there is that conversation, income wealth. And I find it weird where people are like, is it income or is it jobs or is it assets? I mean, and, and obviously it's both, right? Like, I mean, your income and employment ability is going to help you get to wealth. But, of course, your income and employment doesn't define where you are wealth-wise. And there's been great studies that Anne's been a part of that have helped highlight that. But I think uh, one of the things we, I've been trying to do is I've joined Prosperity Now. I used to be the NAACP Economics Department. Before that, was United, uh, with, with, with United for a Fair Economy, was trying to uh, help the asset development field, help this language understand that wealth and assets includes income and includes healthcare, having a more holistic understanding of what it means to build wealth and assets in this society and integrate that into a racial wealth divide frame. And just the final thing I'll say is, too, we're not going to try to get much in depth about this, but you know, I just want to recognize that, of course, there are differences between, uh, you know, African Americans with racial wealth divide versus Latinos versus Asian Americans versus Native Americans versus getting subcategories of African immigrants and men and, you know, women. And, you know, we can break down, we started some of those reports. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of going back to African American a lot because there's a lot of more easier data and data's been around a long time for that. But we can break in to other groups if, if, uh, if the conversation permits us. So before moving on to, the, I want to stay on this framing topic for one more minute or two sure. and ask both, what are some of the harmful ways in which people talk about this or frame the debate around racial wealth and inequities and equality, racial wealth divide? So in other words, because Diedrich, you said earlier, um, often people talk about it as race relations. So what should be on your ban list for words? Like, how should we not be talking about this? I, I don't know if I have a banned list of words, but I think, you know, the, the, the one thing is, you know, a, a positive racial wealth divide is that many people say things are equal. If people recognize there's a racial wealth divide, okay, that's a step forward. But now the, you know, we all are kind of in this mentality that we're in a country that works, we have a good system, 
And if, and if people aren't working well, well, they're doing something wrong, right? That's kind of the mentality. That's the dominant mentality. So if people do, it's also most people want, don't want to believe there is a racial wealth divide. When they come to accept there is, then, then the immediate thought is, oh, well, these communities must be doing something wrong. So what you have to do is fix those communities. And if they just uh, behave right, then uh, they will be on the path of success, which is the natural path for all Americans, right? And so that's the thing that, you know, we're dealing a lot with is like once we get them to recognize racial wealth divide, then we have to start getting them to understand that this isn't a problem of uh, Latinos making bad uh, economic decisions and not knowing how to balance the checkbook but that this is a much larger structural thing. Because if it was just individuals making a bad decision, you wouldn't see racial wealth inequality for African-Americans, Latinos at fairly the same level all across the country. It wouldn't such be a national phenomenon. It would be these people aren't making as good decisions, they're not doing well, but other people you know, who are close to a whole bunch of banks are making really great decisions. But we see it's much more structural and it wouldn't be so consistent over decades because we've had more about financial education over the last 30 years throughout the American public, but yet the American public is less and less economically secure because so much of that wealth is being concentrated uh, at the top. What's on your ban list, Anne? Well, I, I think that the thing for me that, that I've really been focused on is just how I, I think the issue is going to derail in, in so many ways. And, and part of it is what you just mentioned, Cedric, where uh, a number of kind of individual and transactional types of approaches get equated with addressing racial wealth inequity. And I think there are a number of, of misconceptions and, and ideas that conflate a, an individual action with what's actually needed to actually address racial wealth inequity. Um, and that's where, that's where I think we've run off course a little bit. Um, you know, when we really switch between talking about, um, you know, savings and then talking about closing racial wealth gap, that becomes problematic. Not that savings don't matter, of course they do, but that's not what is driving such, a, 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 you know, wide differences in, in wealth. Um, you have to look at public policies over time um, and how institutions are structured to get at why we are positioned the way we are. And so once some of this is, yes, you know, using different types of language, but I think the real key here is what is it that we're actually trying to achieve um, in, this, in this work? And um, the idea that uh, this is about behavior is, is such a pervasive narrative. And one, even when you talk about these structures, the first, I want, the first thing people say is if they would only do this. And so we are constantly having to combat that personal responsibility narrative. And it really bumps up against uh, you know, the idea of addressing this, this, this very, very long-standing issue. So this is a great pivot from narrative to solutions. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll let you come back in for a second, Diedrich. Let me just remind the audience that you can use the question function on your control panel to submit any questions you want to ask um, the panelists or any comments. We're going to turn to your questions in a few minutes. Also, you can engage in this conversation on Twitter, hashtag getting real about race, Hashtag racial wealth gap. Uh, maybe we should add another hashtag racial wealth divide. Feel free. Hmm. You also want to tag our host at Insight CCED and at Prosperity Now. And to come and, back and to if you, and yeah. if, 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 if you want to hashtag me directly, you can just do hashtag Diedrich M, uh, D D R I C K M. So. There we go. All right. So please join us in that Twitter conversation, and then we're going to come to your questions soon. So, Anne, you were just leaving off and talking about narratives of personal responsibility. And it strikes me that the narrative and framing of this issue leads one or stacks the deck towards a certain kind of solutions. So I want to turn to solutions now and ask you both to talk about what are people focusing on in the field in terms of solutions, and especially this distinction between an a focus on individual behavior, so financial literacy programs, uh, getting people to, you know, savings accounts to save more versus structural solutions that look at structures and rules. Talk to us about where the field is and what are the dangers in focusing on one or the other approach. Well, I think we just need to be clear about what we're actually talking about. If you look at this as a continuum, 
and you see something like, you know, financial education uh, on one end of the spectrum and then the racial wealth inequities of another, right? I think it's some of those policies is on ramp. They're on ramp to greater financial stability, of being able to weather some minor financial uh, storm. Um, you know, of course, getting a bit of a leg up, trying to put a little money away for retirement. All of those things are very important. Let me not, uh, you know, underestimate that those are important. Many of those approaches have very little to do with addressing this very grow growing uh, differences as well, the chasm, right? Um, because they're individualistic. You know, if you say if you're going to open up a bank account for a family, which of course is, of course, nothing wrong with families having access to safe products, if we want that, um, it, it, it pales the magnitude in terms of uh, what families are experiencing in terms of college, college debt, um, in terms of uh, the, the values of their home, um, in terms of the types of policies that have led to mass incarceration. Uh, these bigger issues uh, that have to do with segregation, redlining, and mass incarceration uh, feed into much bigger uh, needed structural and, and bold trans, trans, for transformative policies, right? Mm -hmm. When I think about addressing racial wealth and equity, I think about bold, big, transformative policies, because that's the only way we're going to get at these very growing differences. Um, when you think about a city like Boston, for example, where uh, the typical white household has $247,000 in wealth, and the typical black family has $8, you know, you've got to think about what policy is going to help really pull that, that family up um, and, and really enable them to have some sense of, of financial stability um, and being able to pass on wealth to the next generation. Calls for far different types of policies than just uh, uh, savings, right? Uh, this field started off talking about the asset flow, talking about savings. And it was a, a goal at the time to demonstrate that a struggling families could save and could start to uh, find ways to, uh, you know, that would lead to greater social and economic mobility. Uh, but over time, we saw that, that that was being equated with closing the racial wealth gap. And that's when things became kind of incongruent and kind of muddied the waters. Yeah, and, I, and I'll jump in there because I think sometimes, you know, it could appear that I'm muddying waters a bit because, you know, I do believe that um, that the racial wealth divide will not be addressed without, you know, massive change in federal policy and, you know, billions and billions of dollars of investment. I do believe that. But I also believe, though, that racial wealth divide analysis should be used for local nonprofit or, or, uh, organizations, even, fun, even, for, even for financial education. I've been critical of financial education, not just because it's financial education, but because of the idea that most of the time financial education is like, okay, if you make under $18,500, here is your step toward economic advancement. But it doesn't even look at the reality that Whites who make uh, $18,500 and less have a median wealth of $3,000. Blacks and Latinos who have make $18,500 or less have a median wealth of $0. Those are different economic starting places. You need even a different financial education plan for that. So I do push for organizations, nonprofits, individuals to put a racial wealth divide analysis into their own uh, wealth building economic empowerment ladder. But I don't believe that just by doing that, just by putting a racial wealth divide analysis in your financial education program, that will solve the racial wealth divide. I think you need both. But I do think, you know, oftentimes we don't want to tell local nonprofits or individuals, well, there's nothing to do until we get this new, you know, federal policy that we have full employment. You know, I think we want to argue for that. But at the same time, we also, you know, how are people to survive now? That's the fact that they have $8 in Boston of wealth, you know. And I do think a racial wealth divide analysis can be helpful. And I think it can be ways to start helping people have a, a larger frame to advocate for structural change as they hopefully uh, develop best practices for their current reality. And so that's what I 
try to do both with, but I can't see how uh, that can be a little confusing. And sometimes people will just want to say, oh, a financial education problem can't solve the problem. When, of mm. course, anyone who seriously looks at this knows that is not true at all. And I try to be very uh, clear, uh, even when we do work with local nonprofits, here's the racial wealth divide, here's the national problem, now how does that affect your work? Not that your work is going to change the whole national problem. So well, I, I want to jump in. I got to jump in there because I think it's important to say this. And, I, you know, I think that um, part of this reason that we focus in this way is because it's safe and it's easy, right? And, you know, you know, financial education at the point of when you're helping people, for example, buy a home, it's fantastic. When it's coupled with, you know, that people moving into uh, acquiring an asset. Outside of that, I think it's complete. That's very ineffective. Um, I want to talk about what we should be investing funding into to do, right? You know, I, I think, of course, people need uh, resources now. People need income now. They need jobs. And those things are important to sustain even sustain an asset. There's no doubt about that, right? But, you know, there are local uh, efforts that can be undertaken to, to look at structural issues that are actually, on one side, extracting uh, wealth out of communities of color. Certainly, this movement around fines and fees uh, is an example of that. You know, we just heard this week that San Francisco has eliminated these uh, major fines and fees that were overwhelmingly held by black and brown people there, right? I'm talking thousands and thousands of dollars. So while some are trying to give some, a, group, a family $500. That $500 could be wiped out at when they get pulled over for a traffic ticket that can balloon to $5,000. And I think that we have to think about uh, what problem we're trying to solve. And, and it's fine to be solving the problem of let's put some more money in people's pockets. Let's get, you know, greater money for your ITC. Uh, that's all fine to put more money in people's pockets. But when we're talking about really addressing these issues, where is really the investment in this, these, these bigger and bolder uh, kind of policies? Both at a federal level, yes, those are big and bold and longer term, but there are exciting things that could be happening at a local level that could actually mean that people are not mired in uh, debt and have no chance of even being able to build those assets up. So um, it's a matter of me, for me that um, these solutions, the investments in those solutions have been at a level that is, um, you know, something that we can digest more easily, we can get our arms around, and we don't have to deal with some real issues, which one of them is clearly white supremacy and racism. You know, issues that are not uh, easy for people to uh, deal with and talk about. But if we're going to get there, we've got to we've got to dig in. So, so on this point, because we're at solutions part, I want to get in two related questions from our audience and let you let you respond to the questions as well as anything else. So let me just get these questions sure. in. The first is um, the racial wealth gap exists in part because of discrimination and racism. It's what you just referred to, Anne. What about a movement for reparations to close the gap? And then the second question: understanding that wealth is extracted that in fact some have wealth because others don't. Can you please speak on reparations in any form, housing, property, baby bonds, cancellation of debt, higher education, as a plausible policy solution to mend the racial wealth gap or divide? Um, so the reparations question, go. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that I'm all in support I, mean of <laughs> I, I think that when I think about the solutions uh, to address racial wealth inequities, they have to be about, they have to talk about the changing the structures of economic opportunity. And that is about redistribution. It is about reparations in, in, in many forms and restitution. I, I just think that it's unavoidable uh, if we're going to actually think about trying to solve this problem. So um, those are your three R's, Anne, just to be clear. You said redistribution, so my three R's. reparations, yes. and restitution. Right. Redistribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the three R's. Well, and you know, and I think it's it just, you know, and just to get into the uh, redistribution aspect, I mean, I think it's one, it's important. I think this is part of what we try to do when we, when we uh, are educating around racial wealth divide and the work we do 
is we, you know, help highlight that, you know, every year this country spends over a half a trillion dollars in development, in wealth development, right? Mostly through our tax policy. I think it's like over $600 billion a year. But that money mostly goes to the wealthy. You know, I think all of a sudden people think redistribution is like, like all of a sudden we're doing something new. No, we, didn't, we redistribute wealth all the time in the economy. We've been redistributing it to the wealthiest and it maintains racial inequality. So, um, you know, I, I think that can be helpful for people to understand that, 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 you know, we always are distributing and redistributing wealth. It's just now for the first time, it should be to low wealth households for households of color. And of course, any bridging the racial wealth divide is reparation. Now, I think some people think reparations has to mean everybody gets a mil all black people get a million dollars or some some very specific thinking but i mean if you know any type of universal employment thing should need to be have reparations in the back of its mind because we have to address the we have to repair what white supremacy has created that's the heart of the racial wealth divide that's the heart of reparations and you know going back to some comments i was making earlier i mean i do believe that i don't believe racial wealth divide analysis in personal finance or financial education, what have you, is easy because it has to be radical, right? Like, and so any type of racial wealth divide analysis and personal finance has to help you understand and that's the way, uh, you know, we try to do it is that this is the reason why we have, you know, mass wealth inequality. And this is why your community is so much more disenfranchised than other communities. Now, what can you individually do as we work to change the structures as a whole? So I think, you know, I think even racial wealth divide analysis has to be transformative, has to eventually get to structural. But I think it also can be a powerful and effective tool for, you know, smaller nonprofits, for individuals as they're trying to figure out how to survive economically. I think it has to be a both, not one or the other. Yeah, I want to say, you know, the, the analysis that prosperity now has done um, around the upside down, looking at the tax code, I think it's been uh, wonderful in helping us understand um, you know, really how much money uh, is poured in to supporting, these are wealth building uh, programs. Uh, certainly home mortgage deduction is, helps build wealth for a certain class of people and that work has been really pivotal in helping us understand that. Um, I, I think it is very true that you have to think about uh, how do people really understand, uh, you know, why, that, why aren't there even banks in your community? Why are uh, you know, why are opportunities so limited um, for them to, to, to move to different areas of the city? Um, and, you know, you know, a lot of times it's people really to think about, you know, a better way to really educate people. Uh, I, I was mentioning like the Color of Wealth book that was done uh, 12 years ago. I mean, that is not something you're ever going to learn in school. This, these aren't things that people typically learn about. Um, they are not taught. And so, the way to bring that in, even when we're talking about uh, helping individuals and communities build wealth, I just I think it's important to say that an aspect of of addressing racial wealth inequities, I think that the pioneers in this work focused on was community wealth, and and in looking at um, Jessica Nimhart has done great work in thinking about how cooperatives do that and thinking about even in a private way. Uh, even someone, um, Bob Wynn is, is, is talking about how to build uh, families to be able to build these kind of uh, wealth clubs to help them as a family, um, you know, send someone to college or deal with uh, a really big issue. So I think that there's ways that we can think about this, but, uh, you know, more focused on community wealth than just individual wealth. And, and, and going back to your solutions piece, Dorian, I mean, I think we're also getting at the fact that there is, there's not one policy solution, you know, mm -hmm. for the racial wealth divide because there's not only one policy that's been discriminatory. You know, like every type of economic policy has helped create the racial wealth divide, right? Whether it's housing, whether it's tax policy, whether it's employment, whether it's hiring policy. And, you know, it's one of the things that we have put forward is, you know, we need to have much, and again, I go back to this racial wealth divide analysis. We have to have an analysis in all of these policy areas and how to deal with these things and make sure that when we're saying, you know, because Tom Shapiro did an interesting piece, you know, he, he's written a lot of books on racial wealth inequality, how like a good progressive idea, like let's do free universal college, or, or no, I think it would pay off college debt for everyone. And people think, oh, that's just a positive progressive thing and that will help bridge racial wealth inequality. But if you break out the numbers, it actually disproportionately helps white people and it actually will help spread the racial wealth divide. It doesn't mean you don't want to get rid of college debt. You know, he highlighted that if you look at getting rid of college debt for those 
who have ho- from households making fifty thousand dollars or less, then you could do something positive that would bridge racial wealth inequality. So I think that's kind of when we talk about solutions. I mean, we, 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 you know, we can name particular policies, but I think the overall okay. reality but is we have to have a this, racial divide analysis in all policies. So on this, though, I, I want to push you, and I'm going to bundle two sure. two additional questions from the the audience. So one question is. Yep. What immediate public policy initiatives would you suggest on the local, state, and national levels to address the disparities being discussed? And the second question is, um, I think, let's layer it on top of that question. So in this tough political environment, are there any achievable policies that would help address racial wealth inequalities? Well, I think that there's a number of things that we can think about. Because right now, I do think that we, we can be focused on local and state policy. I mean, it, it is the way that I think that we can address the, uh, some of the disparities that we're seeing. I mean, on the extraction side, there's a number of measures. I just talked a lot about fines and fees and, and the work that's being done in California. And I'm talking about hundreds of millions, you know, uh, you know, even billions of dollars that is being extracted that, that can actually be addressed. Um, localities are taking on measures themselves to deal with levels of segregation and um, and also kinds of fines and fees. These are immediate things that people are doing right now that can make a difference on the extraction side. Of course, people have have been pushing for, you know, safer products and services and that kind of thing that are also extracting wealth. So on the extraction side, I think that it's a lot, uh, there's a lot there. Um, Focusing on mass incarceration impact is, is certainly, Bail reform are certainly things that are tied to racial wealth and equity. On the aspirational side, I think it's a little bit tougher, but I do think that you know when we're seeing uh, you know someone going out and and and, and doing a, a, a UBI experiment like we're seeing in Stockton, there's nothing that could prevent us from doing a baby bond uh, proposal or experiment. Um, I think we, the real key here to me, Dorian, is that we haven't spent enough of our efforts on really thinking about those real aspirational policies and some of those which I know that, that uh, Derek was standing about years ago that people thought were like, too far-fetched um, that are now getting a lot more airplay. But it, the, the, thinking, the, the, the thinking really has been so incremental. Um, but I, I do think there's opportunities for us to, to experiment on, on a state and local level. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start off agreeing with Ann in that, you know, when people put for, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we're in this political environment, so what kind of, pretty much the saying, what type of small victories can you get? And I, I don't think that's the right frame because, you know, as Trump has shown, as Bernie Sanders has shown, what seems completely, you know, completely politically impossible one year or one month think radically change in the next six months. And so I think, and I think there's too often times a strategy of, well, what, let's say what we can, what we think can get done, but we're never saying what actually will have the effect we want. And I think actually then what you do is you dissuade uh, populations from even supporting you because you'll say, oh, this little tax change, this is helping to the racial wealth divide, but then nothing happens to the racial wealth divide. And the conservative narrative, see, policy doesn't matter, forget it. So I think we have to give forth policies that really will matter uh, I think on the local level, you know, there's this massive issue of gentrification, of pushing out communities of color, out, you know, uh, suburbanizing poverty. I think one practical thing right now we could do is like any type of development, redevelopment in cities needs to have a race and economic analysis about what communities are being brought in, what communities are getting jobs from these things, and say, no, it has to be equitable. We have to make sure that the people who have been living here are getting whatever percentage of the benefits necessary, that it's not even strengthening. Of racial inequality. So I think there's actually plenty of practical things that could be done, particularly at the city level where minority voices have more power politically, so they don't have that much power economically, because usually the development is being run by people outside of the city who, who finance it. So you have to use our political power there to maybe help navigate those finances. Right. So one I thing wanna... I want to say about that is, I just want to say one more point about that, because I think it's important for us, and you said to Cedric about we're always, you know, we're not really talking about what we really need to do. And this idea of always being shut down because it's saying, that's not possible. That's not possible. That's not possible right now. And when you think about uh, a couple of things that we could be focusing on, one is disenfranchisement. 
we have to think about how we're going to build power, how we're going to actually be able to even do those things. Uh, uh, and so there are opportunities to think about that now, but if not now, when are we going to be thinking about these new world policies? When is that supposed to happen? It's almost like when this is brought up, and I, and I, and I, I know that actually when uh, a bold agenda was put forward by uh, Meiju and Insight uh, seven years ago, uh, people thought it went too far, right? And, and so these bold ideas are shut down before we can even begin to say, hey, what would this look like? Um, before anyone will invest and say, what would a structure for a big bond look like? Let's, let's study this to understand the mechanism and how this will work. There hasn't even been investment there. So I think the issue is, is that we're quick to say, everyone always says, what can we do now? Of course we have to do things now. But when are we actually going to vision? When are we going to actually imagine? Because no one thought that we would be talking about the erosion of Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security like we are. But that was, that was a vision that a group of Americans had 30 or 40 years ago. And now look where we are. Um, I just think that we're on the wrong track and we shut ourselves down for uh, uh, reimagining what needs to happen in this country for there to be inclusion of all people. Right. At least let your policies be defeated, right? Don't, don't, don't shut down your policies before you even present them. Like, like at, least, at, least, at least campaign for them and defeat them before, and let them be defeated versus the idea, well, I can't even say it because there's no way it's going to happen. So I'm in complete agreement. One of my favorite phrases is, let us be realists. Let us do the impossible. Because that is what is required to bridge the racial wealth divide. We have to do something radically different than we've been doing for the last 40, 50 years. Um, so we're quickly running out of time. I want to get a few more questions in. I'm going to read off a few sure. and let each of you take um, whichever ones you like. So uh, a question from an audience member. I appreciate this conversation. I co-lead the Social Work Grand Challenge on reducing extreme economic inequality. There's a bit of debate about reducing economic inequality without taking away from the top 1% of the wealth and income distribution. However, helping families go from zero and negative net wealth to having $5,000 in liquid assets can make a huge difference and alleviate material hardship. They are not the same thing, but will be a huge improvement to what currently exists on the ground. So a comment. Secondly, nonprofits are thinking about closing the racial wealth divide and the conversation is happening across many sectors. But with the Kerner Commission, it took drastic measures for the federal government to consider the issue. What can we do or what will it take for the federal and state lawmakers to really take a look at policies cl to close the racial wealth divide? So we've been having that conversation a little bit. Um, two last ones. These are all, you know, um, really, really small questions. Um, <laughs> oh, think about your answers. They're really actually deep, profound questions. As technology advances, what strategies might you recommend for making sure more wealth circulates within communities of color rather than flowing out of these communities? And last but not least, I'll throw at the two of you, how has the class divide within the African-American community helped or set back progress in addressing the racial wealth divide? So a plethora of great questions. Take your pick. <laughs> and by the way, with our five minutes left, if you want to ask each other one question, you also can do that too. Okay, I, I don't know. I'm trying to remember some of the questions. I'll just dig in on one, and one was talking about, uh, you know, uh, nonprofits looking at least trying to get people some liquid assets, $5,000 in liquid assets. Um, one thing is when we really look at, at the data and, and see that, uh, for example, in any city that, uh, that we've looked at as part of the, the math study that uh, Derek and Sandy has launched, there is not one city where, where Blacks have more than $4,000 a month mm -hmm. that we looked at. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at liquid assets, it, it's so dismal. Um, zero is the number for Mexican Americans in LA. You know, you're talking about like $11 and, you know, $200 in liquid assets. And so I think this is a, a little bit more difficult than we think. It might be easier to get someone $500 of emergency savings, but actually you get them to that point of having $5,000 in liquid assets when they barely have that in, uh, you know, a, a net worth of, of $5,000 is going to be is going to be challenging. And so I think it's just a matter of too when we set those goals to say really how, how are we going to move move people from here to there, and it, and it is going to have to be a, a, a multiple a multiple multiple approaches to even get 
people to even some to even positive uh, a network. And, and one comment on that question that Ann uh, was addressing is, you know, I think it's also uh, important that. Oh, actually, I just lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> what was the what, what was the question you were addressing, Ann? Oh, 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 oh really the, uh, nonprofit. The nonprofit piece. Yeah. I think it's important for people to understand too the difference between bridging the racial wealth divide and just trying to uh, create stronger economic sustainability or survival. You know what I mean? Because it's one thing to say, you know, we're going to try to help people, you know, be a little bit more employed or, you know, they have a median wealth of zero. Now we're going to get into 500 or to $1,000. Okay, you know, that's not really bridging the racial wealth divide. That's not getting you close to 140,000 or what have you. It doesn't mean it's not important, but you also got to be clear what you're doing. Like, I'm trying to do something to help people survive a little bit more, have a little bit more money in the pocket. But that's not bridging the racial wealth divide. And that's something I try to help clarify in our conversations. What are you doing? You're just trying to help some, you know, lower income people of color, low wealth people of color, and, you know, and help the situation a little bit. That's one thing. But don't call that bridging the uh, racial wealth divide. Uh, I, to, to respond to the uh, uh, class distinction or class question within the African-American community, you know, I, I'm interested in looking more into that. But one thing I think when you look at wealth is you actually realize, and, uh, and, and what my brother's name always, Antonio Moore, has done a lot on this about how few, uh, you know, truly wealthy African-Americans there are. You know, I think oftentimes if you look at wealth, you get a lot more clarity that, you know, being at the poor is not a low-income black problem. It's a mid-income. It's even a high-income African-American problem of being low wealth. And so I think even with our own community, it'll help us understand that actually a lot higher income African-Americans have a lot more in common with working class African-Americans because both of you don't have much wealth and both of you about a paycheck away from uh, being in financial turmoil. So, you know, again, I think, I think sometimes our confusion about where we are class-wise might hurt us politically. But actually class-wise, we're a lot more unified than people would think. I'm going to just piggyback on that point to say, uh, look at the data around black women with college degrees, you know, under 40, um, they have no wealth. So I agree, like looking at the black middle class, the class, that class divide is not as big as people think it is. Okay, so really lightning round, we have a minute left. So one final question to each other. Yeah, with one minute left, the only question I have to end is when can we do this again? And that I look forward to it because I don't think we have much more, you know, much more time to get deeper into this. But I, I, I do, I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope those who have come on have also enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I love that too. I mean, uh, we were doing a prep check and we were really getting into some other other issues here. And I think it's, it's there's, there's really a lot of dimensions to this, to this work. And I think there's some real exciting work that, that I, I wish people could really see, uh, you know, where it's heading. Um, I, I really think that we're learning more about the dynamics of racial wealth and equity more now than we ever have. And so, um, you know, Dietrich's focus is really thinking about what the future will look like in, in, in 228 years. Um, I think the idea of, of talking about this future would be a great next, next segment, like really get into what does the future hold and what can we really do to be future forward? And, well, and that, to get more I, information, yep. and to get more information, people should go to Insight CCED's website. They can go to the Bridging the Racial Wealth Divide Facebook page. They can go to the Race and Wealth Podcast. And what, what's the name of your podcast again? In Truth. <laughs> so, in yeah, truth. you can go to Ann. Yeah, that's what, because, because again, you know, we can't discuss all this in an hour, but there's, there are a lot of great things. Sandy Darity, Derek Hamilton, Mariko Chang, there's a whole long list of people who are doing great things, and I hope more people do follow up. Well, it sounds like for the future, we need to do this again. So um, let me first thank Ann and Diedrich and all the attendees for joining us today. Um, we promise we're going to do this again, right? Is that a commitment I have? Yeah. From okay, good. Um, thanks for sharing your thoughts <laughs> on this issue. If you missed any part of today's conversation or you want to share with colleagues, it will be released on the Insight Center's Hidden Truths podcast that Ann just mentioned and the Race and Wealth podcast hosted by our very own Diedrich from Prosperity Now. Be sure, as Diedrich said, to visit insightcced.org for more conversations, research, resources on racial wealth, equity, and other issues of economic security and racial justice. To learn more about Diedrich's work with the Racial Wealth Divide Initiative at Prosperity Now, Visit prosperitynow.org, where you can find a host of resources on this issue. 
Um, I'm Dorian Warren. It's been great to be with our two great speakers this afternoon. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you very soon to continue this discussion.